Well, tonight is going to be an awesome show. We have a guest that was on... Oh, boy. I think it's been... I know it's been at least over a year, for sure. Probably going on two years, I would say, but definitely a year. Uh, his name is Paul Bells. He has had uh, numerous publications uh, in a wide range of poetry books and websites, articles on early childhood education uh, related typically or usually to science and environmental issues, and many articles on travel and natural history. He has two books right now. The one that we're going to be reading from tonight is called Sometimes the Soul Needs Chocolate, Pandemic Odes. And before we go any further, his name is Paul Bells. How are you doing, Paul? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Let's try that one more time. Say hello again. Hello, hello. You know, it helps to have the mi- right microphone on. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, usually, you know, no one else gets to hear you if that's not up. So this first book you have is uh, currently available in the bookstore in Made in Chico. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And then at a very small footnote, we're going to highly encourage, please shop local. But if you can't find it on the local one or if you're listening from somewhere far abroad, you can find us on Amazon, these books, or this book on Amazon in particular. Yeah, that's correct. Cool. And then I know you have another book that's coming out soon. What, what is that one going to be about? That book is all about Bidwell Park, human and natural history. And it's, well, it's dedicated to the well-loved b- late biologist Wes Dempsey, who a lot of people know. I, I talk about a lot of the issues that have made the park the place it is, controversies, and a lot of positive things going on in a nutshell that's what that's about wonderful wonderful well let me think if i missed anything on our intro so far i don't think so do you want to dive into the readings sure let's do that okay this first one Are we ready, Kevin? We are ready. What's it called? It's called Ode to a Canada Goose. (laughs) And one reason why I'm reading this one is it was recently nominated for a Pushcart Prize. That's a prize that's oriented towards writers for independent magazines. And someone who has won the prize is eligible to nominate others. Wow. So someone nominated this one. And we'll have to wait and see. After the first of the year, I'll be asked to nominate two others on my own. It's very competitive, but it's really an honor to have been nominated. Yeah, no kidding. And uh, I'm just going to call it here. I'm going to say that you already have it. Uh, That I went? That you already have it. (laughs) Thank you. That's very optimistic. You heard it first here. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Ode to a Canada Goose. You waddle over ebony basalt. Past purple lupins, orange poppies that fill cracks in volcanic rock that's so rugged any walker might skip. Coyote, deer, human, bear, they all wobble along. You're not built for land, tan-breasted one. How do you fare so well here, stunned by life in the hot dust so close to the crackling stream? where you can paddle, swim, and thrive, did hunger or wonder bring you? Maybe your black eyes revel in grass that's so emerald it nearly stings. Grazing bird who plucks algae from ponds, do unknown blossoms taste good? Lemon buttercups, cherry red columbines, you could grasp them in your beak, swallow them in bits, but you don't eat. Can you revel and dry and dream of more than food? Take notes on the chemistry of sweet scents, hot colors, satin textures, round or diamond leaves? Do you create poems, dialogues with flowers? Ignorant humans need to know your mind. Translate rock for us. I see why this has been nominated. Well done on this one. Thank you. Before I make any comments, uh, would you like to unpack a little bit more for us? Well, this literally happened. Um, My partner Kate and I were hiking up by... um, farther up in uh, Upper Park a few years ago, up where there is a whole lot of basalt, and there were a lot of wildflowers growing on the basalt up by Iron Canyon area, and there was this Canada goose wandering through there, and it seemed to be enjoying the flowers. 
And it's just an interesting question. What do animals know? There's a lot of research going on about animal consciousness, and a lot of it's conjecture. But um, a lot of species do seem to know a lot more than we think. I can't say that Canada geese necessarily do, but who knows? And I heard um, at some point that Canada geese are a, a very large driving force of the nitrogen cycle, um, mm-hmm. specifically with their defecation going oh, across yes. large uh, swaths of land, essentially, in the globe. Mm-hmm. They carry nutrients back and forth that are pretty important for forests and uh, oceans. A couple other interesting things about Canada geese is they do mate for life. Oh. And if you ever see a Canada goose or a couple of Canada geese with goslings, there is a fair chance they're males. Wow. Because the males do take care of the goslings. How oh, beautiful. And yeah. I, a lot of people don't like them for some reason, but I think they're pretty cool. Yeah, a lot of people don't like a lot of strange things for weird reasons, so <laughs> chalk it up to that one. <laughs> Tell me about it. And I want to say before this next piece, thank you for being an advocate for an animal that can speak English. Highly appreciate that. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. This one is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm rooting for you to get the nomination because I think this one really deserves it. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah. We shall see. <laughs> What's our next one we got? Our next one is called... Ode to Social Change. And I'll read this one, and maybe I'll say a couple of things about it. In a time of shouts, I whisper. In a time of sandpaper and buzz saws, I make a stab at song. I hide books in a bonfire ton. They cower together in my shadowed room where I bring them bread, soup, and wine. I give them candle-lit tables and chairs. They can argue, wrestle, dream. In a demon time, I celebrate hope, faith in bittersweet life, knowing that all answers are flawed. We can turn corners without stumbling. In a time of gloom, I laugh. I, I will comment after your comment. I wrote this probably about three and a half years ago when we were really going through the pandemic and when there was a lot of social upheaval about everyone knows what I'm talking about, of course. And there was a total feeling of despair and depression among a lot of people thinking nothing was ever going to change and that we were, the society was going to descend into a time of people just attacking each other constantly. So this was an attempt to write something positive. And and I did think of this one because we are in a very similar period right now, period of very serious despair and fear for a lot of people. So this seemed very relevant to me. I was going to say this is um, amongst one of the most positive pieces I've ever read, Hmm. and I appreciate that. Can I read my favorite a uh, couple lines from Sure, me. go ahead. Uh, it, I have to read it out loud because it like struck me in the heart pretty, pretty intensely. In a demon time, I celebrate hope, faith in bittersweet life, knowing that all answers are flawed. Thank you. <laughs> that piece You're right welcome. there is... is uh, I'm trying to think of a good description for it, but words escape me. It is beautiful and not flawed whatsoever. Uh, I think that there... Um, you know, we learn through a lot of uh, copying behaviors in our societies as a human species. A lot of what we learn is mirrored language, mirrored actions, mirrored behavior, pa- behavioral patterns, all this stuff. Really well scientifically proven on how we go about social um, learning and, and um, acquisition and refinement. And it definitively, um, things don't change if everyone hops on the same bandwagon. So this is such a... this is. Um, I would say positive, but if I had to put a word, descriptive word before that, rebellious and positive, I would say. It has some strength to it for that. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. No, I agree with what you're saying. There's there's a lot of tribalism. Yeah. And I don't think tribalism is going to get us anywhere. That's part of what I'm trying to get through here. Yeah. No, this is, this is, this is, uh, to me, reading this piece, at least in my head when I see it, it's like having a candle in a very dark room. Thank you. That's very flattering. Yeah. Please go on to the next one. Now, the next one's it's called Sometimes the Soul Needs Chocolate, so this is Ode to Chocolate. You've got to linger with dark chocolate. 
it's a waste if you chomp on it real fast thrust it to the back of your mouth swirl it with spit squeeze it down your throat then it will feel like melted wax taste kind of like sugar and nope nothing more you'll think huh what was that and walk away shrugging no concentrate bite little pieces thoughtfully swish them you might notice cinnamon nutmeg vanilla beans pepper sweet thunderstorms on your tongue sometimes the soul needs chocolate when we're flung towards chaos and plagues bigots wildfires and powerful fools leap our way cacao lifts us up unbinds our tongues helps us stand on the speeding ground food of the gods keep us wild again i'll let you comment first then i'll add on, I'll add on after <laughs> Well, chocolate for a lot of people is kind of healing. And I wrote this at a time when a lot of people really needed a lot of healing and a real sense of something delicious and beautiful. And in a lot of Mexican Mayan thinking, chocolate is called the food of the gods. Cacao. And the best chocolate I've ever had was in Ecuador, mm, wow. which was, it was just exquisite. <laughs> So, just a celebration of something simple but very, very beautiful in a time of despair. There's three things that are coming to mind for in my head when you read this. First one is, um, you know, I love, one thing I love about this show is uh, I like when writers take the time to slow something down and discuss it. Something that typically is eaten, maybe, or uh, consumed voraciously, this is apropos for this piece, for sure. Something that is consumed quickly and not really appreciated as much as it could be. So that was the first thing that hit my mind was, thank you for appreciating this mm-hmm. exquisite food that we're talking about. And the other two are kind of tied. Um, I really like how you structured this entire piece because, one, you're not only slowing down the process of going through eating chocolate. So the piece itself is geared towards the... It kind of feels like it's melting. Mm-hmm. And by the time you hit the end, you've you've consumed the whole thing, which I think is beautiful. And the second one is it's also structured like a pyramid in that same sense, in the sense, uh, in the meaning, I guess, that we start with a slow piece and then at the end you reveal, listen, this is a food of the gods, which is a powerful statement to say. That's a really potent one. And you end with that as just a strong, strong final food of the gods. Sorry to, for everyone who's had an ear pop in their head right there, but uh, <laughs> I think that's a beautiful way to end this piece. Food of the gods, keep us wild. That's a This entire piece, really well written. Good job. A lot of us, we really needed a feeling of wildness back then. There was just so much <laughs> disassociation. People were walking around feeling numb and feeling just totally despairing about the world in general. Massive rigidity. Massive rigidity. And yeah. again, I fear we're going back there. Hopefully not. Hopefully this book is uh, pushes against that a little bit. Because I, I do think that um, all art forms, especially writing, have a have one of their strongest places are in reminding us that things are not as dire as they currently are. Um, you know, by slowing things down. So thanks for that. And life is very bittersweet, just like dark chocolate. Yes. <laughs> what do we got next? <laughs> what do we got next? This is one, I'll tell you a little bit about this one. I I told my old friend Norm I was writing odes, and he said, oh, you should write an ode to oddness. So, Norm, if you're out there, I don't know if you are, but you, you, I know you know this one. I'll read it anyway. We slept beside freeway on-ramps, sheltered by tall weeds. We hid from cops all night, hitched rides with farmers, religious cults, drunk truck drivers who passed on the road's shoulder, kind folks and angel dust heads. We learned to drive at 40. We're the odd. We rescue twirling bees in swimming pools, catch indoor spiders in cups, free them on shrubs, break for butterflies and crows. We're the odd. We tune out the Super Bowl, run from its monotonal buzz, prefer Walt Whitman to a quarterback, run from, no, can't define a line of scrimmage. We're the odd. We loved weird Spider-Man, science nerd gone super, but still bookish. 
bullied like we were and forced to hide his strength, running through shadows from everyone who blamed him. We're the odd. We love broccoli. Its green flowers taste like topsoil. It's better than bacon, the sizzling flesh that clogs people with salty fat. We're the odd. We thrive on loneliness, find shelter in basalt canyons, white, where chalk, I'm sorry, where orange poppies and lupins thrive and dust caresses, caresses our skin. We wail with stars, we're the odd. Our words have their own shapes and colors, don't mix with jigsaw language that everyone else understands. We're one version of the odd, but celebrate. You're weird, too. I love this piece. Uh, would you like to comment first again? Everybody's strange. Everybody is unique, and we all have our own quirks, and that's something that's not realized. A lot of people realize that not that everyone out there has something unusual about them. You know, for the sake of just purely survival... Rep, rep, uh, rep, repetition, repetitive um, genetic chemistry mm-hmm. uh, tends to die quickest than massive, diverse entities and species. And I think that some of the strongest things that we have going is a genetic system that runs pretty well and is repeatable through histories or through um, procreation, but also a, a really big diversity that I think also lends to that strength is our, our um, differentiation in thought. And that's where I think we find a lot of weirdness within societies is how people are thinking and acting and behaving. And I think that's what makes us such a um, fortified species, personally. And I don't know if you did this intentionally or not, but this is my one of my favorite series, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, favorite books. Um, the page number that you put this on is 42, which I find funny because, uh, you know, meaning to life, number 42. And so, oh, Dodness, you know, it all kind of synced in my head. And I was like, that's, I don't know if you did that on purpose, but if you didn't, that is beautiful <laughs> i did not put that do that on purpose but you want to know something funny hmm. in the books 42 is the answer but in the original radio radio drama 43 is the answer <laughs> and the uh, when they find out what the question is the ultimate question it's what do you get when you multiply six times seven oh, oh. and this proves that there's something fundamentally wrong with the universe wow <laughs> Good old Douglas Adams. Yeah, thanks for that one. Are we are out of just curiosity before we go to the next one. Are we reading the next one on page forty three? Is it the next <laughs> next one? Well, I could. Let's see what's on page forty three. Not to change our whole structure, but <laughs> it's perfectly funny. okay. Ode to ignoring a job. Ode to ignoring a job ad. This one also, in its own way, relates to what was going on then. Pale sign on cemetery's black fence calls. Now hiring. No details like the wages, benefits, duties. Just two words that make me hide behind a laugh. Would my boss demand total discipline? No motion, nothing that would disturb ants, beetles, fungi, grass, daisies, worms. Employees whose work is to be dead, lie on your backs. Let time leave you alone. You'll need talent for this lack of heart and thought. The no feeling in your lips, skin, even your groin. I'm so glad I don't need this work. I couldn't record birds and their songs without my hearing and sight. I'd be useless monitoring weather if my mind were so gone. Gardening would be tough with numb, stiff hands. Hmm... Could I be a travel writer sending dispatches from the next world? Intriguing, but so far no one's work has arrived. Presenting the afterlife in an email. I'll find earthbound adventures to describe. So bye-bye, sign. You'll find folks with no choice. They'll flock to you. For now, I'll run away. Please comment first. I have a few things I want to say. This one, this one has made me uh, uh, smirk quite a bit. <laughs> well, it made me squirk, smirk quite a bit, too. And, of course, it was at a time when a lot of people were thinking about death. And so it was just so ironic. 
I thought this uh, sign on the cemetery gate saying now hiring and it was kind of it was troubling at the time too yeah kind of troubling in the sense that it was saying poorly more timed and, yeah more and more people are going to be coming here oh yeah on the cemetery's back fence oh man yeah I, I call I was laughing when it says now hiring no details like the wage benefits duties just two words that made me hide uh, make me hide behind a laugh I call those jobs or at least whenever I see an ad posting like that anywhere in our society just a hook with maybe like a penny on it just it goes nowhere we have no clue who's fishing but it's just a little bit of money and it's it's definitely a hook it's not probably safe for you to apply for that job <laughs> this is true yeah that's beautiful well we're probably have time for i'd say one more one more well, yeah. let me think for a second then take your time while you're thinking i just want to um kind of highlight you have a beautiful speaking style when you read your your pieces here oh thank you well practiced maybe i'll do this one i was kind of thinking about doing this one hmm. this is and i'll say something about this when i'm done okay ode to confined redwoods I want to be your jailbreak friend who will lift your roots from parched soil. We'll sneak away from this parking lot where you're confined. The coast calls us. Its summer fog is your true water. Here where you're caged, a sprinkler turns dry earth around you, damp, not soaked. Scrub jays and red-shouldered hawks perch on your shoulders. Your branches, you like them fine, but yearn for spotted owls and marbled murelets to rest on you. Thirsty pets, you stand here in straight rows. Shade, shade parked cars in this summer drenched land. I'll free you all, we'll hide by day. Hunker down in warehouses and barns, follow shooting stars by night. Sneak across freeways, drink from creeks until we get to your fog-nurtured home. Just past the salty sea wind's reach. Let's run towards the Pacific. Sorry, damn, I can't find the key to your cage. We're stuck. You greet me like chained dogs when I step outside. Teach me to bark. Mm. Please, please elaborate. I won't even... There are a lot of redwoods in different parts of Chico. And this is not their habitat. And my thought in writing this one was, let's free the redwoods, let's run for the coast. <laughs> and again, it came at a time when a lot of people were feeling a lot of confinement. Yeah. And just a whole lot of stuckness. And my idea was just freeing the redwoods was kind of an act of liberation in a sense. Freeing the redwoods, freeing ourselves. Especially with the uh, enticement of taking them to a travel to a destination because we were not even able to travel that much. So, yeah. That's right. Well, we're in the last, I'd say, four minutes of our show. Would you like to do some questions? Sure. So uh, I've kind of gotten to taking or uh, I guess gotten used to asking some of the same questions towards the end. So I'll ask a, maybe a couple generic then maybe something a little bit of a curveball. But for new writers who are stepping into this field and have heard your book, which – before I ask this question, you can find Paul's current book at in Chico at the bookstore and Made in Chico. And then far off before, if you can't exhaust those two avenues, you can find it on Amazon. And the title of the book was Sometimes the Soul Needs Chocolate uh, Pandemic Odes by Paul Bells, B-E-L-Z. So on to the question. For new writers who have heard maybe this show and gone, I'd love to start writing. This is beautiful. What advice would you give them? Sit down and do it. I'm sure everybody says that, but that's really what it takes. You just find a place where you feel comfortable, find yourself in an environment where you want to describe things. It could be the park. It could be a cafe. It could be anywhere you want. It could be your uh, bedroom if you want. You could write things from your bedroom and just write whatever comes f to your mind, and then you refine it. And the stuff that comes out of you at first might be pure drivel. That's just the way it works. But then uh, it'll get the juices flowing. And the nice thing is, is it doesn't require a lot of materials to start. Pen it and paper. Do, it does not. It requ uh, a, um, well, you can, you can do it on your phone. I tend to write in a journal, and then I put things on my computer and revise them. It's just I find it, a lot of people find it to be more physical to write in a journal and to write on a phone or on a computer to begin with. 
but everybody does it differently and no way is correct no so, way is correct please know that we are not uh, advocating for one or the other uh mm -hmm. my next question would be how, how has writing helped you? Has it been a therapeutic process? Has it helped you through uh, seeing um, maybe something that was inside of you, an emotion, seeing it physically? Has that changed you at all? What has it done for you? It clarifies my thinking and it clarifies my feeling. And it might sound like a cliche, but it's a lot of people say it's very centering. You write and you really express what's really going on in your life and in your environment and you become more and more aware of things. And this is especially really beneficial and helpful in crisis times. And yeah, once again, we're in a crisis time. And I really do encourage people to write about it. Really, whatever is in you, come out. I think personally on that same note, uh, whenever I've had something that has been stinging inside me that could use um, some air, some cleaning, or some just some attention on it, mm -hmm. I haven't been able to get it out of me in any other way. Usually if I can sit down, quiet my mind, and have a moment to write about that, um, it's, it's I don't want to say alarming, but maybe the sensation is a little bit alarming, how quickly my brain stops fixating on the thing that I've just put on paper, even for just that rest of that afternoon. It doesn't have to be long, but it's enough to give my head some space to calm so i think there's something to be said about the act of bringing it out onto something physical is is you know typing uh, phone writing just bringing it out into a uh, something you can see there's something about that yeah definitely well paul this has been awesome having you on the show it's been a lot of fun thanks kevin and i think uh we've been planning so stay tuned eventually maybe when your second book is out we'll have you back on to talk about that one i will be in touch wonderful and again sometimes the soul needs chocolate pandemic odes by paul bells find it at the bookstore made in chico and way off in amazon too so please try to shop local first and support the uh the artists and the people that are here locally